Hi, this is Stu Turgill, your host for The Phoenix File, a weekly news magazine and community conversation with the people and programs making a positive impact on the quality of life in our community. Happy 241st birthday, America. It's Independence Day, and what better way to celebrate July 4th on The Phoenix File than to talk about the document that gave birth to the nation. On tonight's show, I'll be talking about the Declaration of Independence with ASU history professor Catherine O'Donnell. She'll discuss some of the little-known and misunderstood facts and maybe even bust some myths about the critical document that led to the establishment of the United States of America. Stay tuned for our special 4th of July edition of The Phoenix File, coming up next right here on Radio Phoenix, where the Valley comes to talk, sing, connect. I'm Stu Turgill, your host for The Phoenix File, a weekly news magazine and community conversation with the people and programs making a positive impact on the greater Phoenix community. Well, welcome to a special July 4th edition of The Phoenix File. Tonight, as we celebrate the birth of the nation, I'm delighted to have as my guest Catherine O'Donnell. She's the Associate Professor of History at Arizona State University, and I've invited Professor O'Donnell to be with us tonight to talk about some of the fascinating fascinating and perhaps lesser known facts about the Declaration of Independence. And during our conversation, she may even dispel a myth or two about the document that led to the separation from England and which created the United States of America. And hopefully by the end of the show, you'll have a greater appreciation for what Independence Day is really all about. And spoiler alert, it's not about mattress, car, and furniture sales or hot dog eating contests at Coney Island. Professor O'Donnell is a summa cum laude graduate of Amherst College, where she she earned a BA in history and she earned her PhD in history at the University of Michigan. She serves as the director of undergraduate studies on the history faculty at ASU. Professor O'Donnell, thanks for being here tonight and welcome to the Phoenix File. Thank you. Well, let's begin with what I think is interesting and curious to me that every school child knows about the significance of the Declaration of Independence, but few of us know much of anything of the backstory of how the document came to be written and published. So 241 years after it was signed, the Declaration is regarded as a pretty big deal. But how big a deal was it at the time? Tell us some of the things about the Declaration we may not know. It's such an interesting story. Of course, one thing to keep in mind is that there had been a years-long, really wrenching struggle uh, between the colonies and, and England over the colonists' desire at first to have the right simply as British people. They wanted nothing more than to be treated as truly British and kind of famously Ben Franklin himself sat on the throne when he was in London and just thought this is the greatest thing and it was only when the the British kind of refused to allow the colonists to be truly British that they decided all right then we'll make something else up and we'll become American uh, and so that took kind of years and some colonists moved much more quickly down that path than than others um, so that's one thing people might uh, might not recognize uh, shots had already been been fired, right? Lexington and Concord uh, is in 1775. And even that didn't uh, prompt many colonists to really desire absolute independence. It just seemed, for one thing, that they were unlikely to defeat the British Empire. And for another thing, again, there's this question of, well, what are we? If we're not British, what what does it mean to, to be American? What was the biggest surprise in, in how it all came about? Well, I think from the point of view of Parliament and the King, the biggest surprise was it that it ever did come that it about. happened yeah that it happened at all uh, you Oops. know that, that these sort of squabbling colonists who really in many cases did not like each other would would unite in this way just seemed so improbable when Jefferson well was he given the assignment to uh, yeah to, so to there's a committee of five mm -hmm. uh, including Jefferson Franklin uh, John Adams Livingston who's or Sherman who's somewhat less known very quickly that committee told Jefferson and that he should do it. And it was in part because Jefferson was known as a stylist. It was also because John Adams knew no one could stand John Adams. Um, 
And he really quite wisely felt that something this important could not come from him and more seriously could not come from Massachusetts because Massachusetts was already seen as the firebrand, right? And so it was strategically important to bring in another colony, particularly Virginia. So when it was eventually shared with the members of the Second Continental Congress, was there consensus that the document that was presented was okay or was there debate? Uh, what what yeah, was the process that's like? A great question. Jefferson, by the way, very carefully kept his rough rough draft. I always show this to my students. Like, you see, Jefferson wrote drafts, and so should you. Um, he kept his rough draft because he felt that that was the tr truer expression of the ideas and that uh, the edits that Congress made, because the Continental Congress did make edits, watered down the document. I have to say almost no one agrees with Jefferson. If you look at those edits, there's nothing terribly substantive that's changed, and the language, which was already quite lovely, was made ever so slightly more elegant. But the the kind of wrenching process of debate had gone on in those earlier years that I talked about more, and this group is a fairly self-selected group, although there were still those who were more foot draggers. My understanding is that there were 56 signers. Yes. And that 41 of them were slave owners. Yeah. In the first draft, if I'm not mistaken, there was reference to the abolishment of yeah. slavery or the prohibition against slavery in the first draft. It didn't make it to the second draft. Is that largely because the majority of these folks were themselves slave owners? That is such a good question. And I have to tell you, as I heard myself say, there's not a substantive change. The, the slavery bell went off <laughs> in my head as something that's real. So, of course, Jefferson is one of those slaveholders, right? It did not take 200 years, let's just say, for people to see the hypocrisy of slave owners arguing for freedom. In fact, this bothered some participants. This was something that uh, some British observers used to mock the colonists, that they were the slaveholders yelping for liberty. There was some suggestion that to wade into this question of slaveholding, to go even further than Jefferson did in the finished document in blaming the king for an economic system that, in fact, the colonists themselves fully embraced. There, there was a sense that that might be unseemly. Um, but your broader point, which is, was slavery an issue that people shunted to the side in order to keep consensus on other issues? That is the case and would also be the case at the Constitutional Convention, where some, including Ben Franklin by that point, argued that slavery should be debated, and the consensus was, we'll never bring along South Carolina, we'll never bring along Virginia in this process if they feel that slavery is at risk. Is there a myth that can be busted? I'll say a few things. I don't have anything as good as it was actually written in French. You know, I don't have it that dramatic a myth. Uh, but I think one, one myth that I hear from my students when they come into my classes is that there was this utterly tyrannical and despised British government and an utterly united group of colonists. And that's just not the case. Britain really, you know, entered into this sort of awkward dance trying to appease the colonists, trying to keep them together. I always remind students that the British knew perfectly well who Sam Adams was, who John Adams was. They're not put in dungeons. They're not thrown down wells. And that is because the British were constrained by their own sense of law and liberty. So that's that's uh, one one myth. There was a, a lot. There was a lot of love lost between <laughs> the British and the Americans. It's a very slow process. You know, there are smaller things such as it wasn't proclaimed and signed all on July 4th. It's written earlier. It's adopted July 4th. It's being signed into August and even I think into November. People didn't all walk up to a desk and sign it. Right? It's pa it's passed along. It's it's a it's a pr it's a long process. And the last thing I'd say is that the Declaration is argument as much as it is a statement of fact. So it is still trying to persuade people that 
that independence is desirable and possible rather than declaring right. um, that it's already done. And in fact, that's why um, this is very uh, quickly printed up. The fastest horses are found and riders to bring it up and down the seaboard. It's read aloud. And in fact, some of the earliest um, broadsides, there are essentially accent marks to show where the emphasis should be when it's read um, because you are trying to convince people that this is possible, that it's necessary. It was almost performance art. It, it was, was it was really totally. intended to be read more than, um, to be spoken more than, uh, than read. Absolutely. And in New York, sent to New York where Washington has this fairly motley, you know, group <laughs> of militia, the fledgling Continental Army, it's read aloud. Soldiers go and they pull down this gilded statue of George the Third that was up in the Bowling <laughs> Green. Um, they say, oh, we're going to melt it down and make bullets to fire back <laughs> at him. You know, so it absolutely is, yeah. is performance art. Well, it, it, the declaration is not divided into formal sections, but it is often discussed, probably more so by academics <laughs> yeah. than by most <laughs> of us. We love this stuff. Yeah, as consisting of five parts, the introduction, the preamble, the indictment of King George, the denunciation of the British people, and the conclusion. And yet most Americans are likely only familiar with perhaps 15 percent or so of the words that are contained in the text. And the text of the Declaration is approximately 1,320 words, but only a portion of the preamble, maybe 181 words, are known to most of us. We're all familiar with the, the best-known sentence in American history. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But most of the document contains words that few have ever read or heard. Why? Why is that? I guess, as an historian, I'm pleased that people know any of it. <laughs> but I would say that what is remarkable is that any part of a document produced in that urgent and specific a moment rises to the level of general truth claims so that we do remember it. To me, that's what's remarkable. So the statement of grievances, which, which kind of cracks people up, you know, like a statement of grievances, that sounds like something out of science. It's Seinfeld. a real indictment. I mean, um, this is like a court document. It is exactly like a court document, and it is basically uh, like a breach of contract, right. right? So you owed us this. Had you lived up to this, we would still be good subjects, but here are the ways in which you've broken the contract. And, you know, it is a little hard to, to remember, like, well, he summoned our legislatures at uncomfortable places <laughs> far from the natural depositories of our records. You know, it just, it, it doesn't ring um, the way the way the preamble does. Yeah. Um, well, I want to thank you for being with us tonight. Thanks, Professor O'Donnell, uh, for helping us understand a little bit more about the Declaration of Independence on this special July 4th edition of the Phoenix File. Professor O'Donnell, thanks for joining us and for sharing some little-known facts about the Declaration. And a happy Independence Day to you. And to you, too. Well, we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, I'm going to have a very special treat as we wrap up our celebration of America's birthday. You're listening to The Phoenix File. I'm Stu Turgill, and this is Radio Phoenix. Welcome back to our special July 4th edition of The Phoenix File. I mentioned earlier in the show that few of us are familiar with more than 15% or so of the words in what is the document that gave birth to our nation. So on this Independence Day, what better way to fully understand and appreciate the Declaration of Independence than to listen to it being read in this 1957 recording by John Fitzgerald Kennedy. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them 
to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new gods for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having indirect objects, the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance. Unless suspended in their operation, till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, unless those people would relinquish their right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time, after such dissolutions, to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative power, incapable of annihilation, have returned to the people at large for their exercise, the state remaining in the meantime, exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states, for that purpose obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of land. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us, in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He has effected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution and unacknowledged by our laws. 
giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation, for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by a mock trial, from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses, for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government, and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our government, for suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burned our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the work of death, desolation, and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy, scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages, and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens, taken captive on the high seas, to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections among us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an indistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been warning in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity. And we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of a right ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, 
we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Those were the words of John Fitzgerald Kennedy as he recited the full text of the Declaration of Independence 60 years ago in 1957. The Second Continental Congress declared the independence from England on July 2nd. However, it approved the Declaration on July 4th, and that's the day that stuck. John Adams wrote to his wife Abigail that Americans would in the future celebrate what he quoted a great anniversary festival with bonfires and illuminations. Adams was quite right and tonight as you look outside to watch the fireworks that he predicted take a moment to give thanks for all the blessings that our independence has afforded and please pause to give thanks to all those who have served and sacrificed to maintain our freedom. Well, I hope you enjoyed this special Independence Day edition of the Phoenix File. I'll be back next Tuesday with another conversation about the best of our community. For Radio Phoenix, this is Stu Turgill. Good night and happy birthday, America.